What pushes a woman to murder the man she vowed to love and cherish? We all know that women are less prone to violent crimes than men. The Department of Justice reports that men actually commit 90% of the homicides in this country. But when women do kill, in over 50% of the cases, their victims are their intimate partners. And that's exactly what Janine Patton did on January 28th, 2006. I just dropped the gun, and I remember going to him. And I, I look at me. And I just kind of grabbed his face, and I remember screaming, just screaming. My name is Dr. Michelle Ward. I'm a criminal psychologist and trial consultant. I've spent my career researching hundreds of murder cases to determine what drives someone to kill. Because the more we understand about criminal behavior, the better chance we have at preventing it in the future. When Investigation Discovery asked me to go behind prison walls to talk face to face with six violent killers, I had no hesitation in saying yes. Most crime shows are whodunits, but this is different. I want to know why they committed their crimes and go inside the mind of a murderer. Thirty-two-year-old Troy Patton is a small-town Illinois dad who loves family and adventure. He drives a motorcycle and he skydives, and everyone said he was the life of the party. Here's his sister, Lori. They were very close. Troy was funny. He was always cracking jokes. Everybody loved him, loved to be around him. His first marriage unfortunately ends in divorce, and he winds up becoming a single father to his adorable little girls, Brittany and Jessica. But Troy is the kind of guy who believes in love, and he eventually gets remarried to 33-year-old Janine, who takes his last name. His mother, Lola, is thankful that he has the happiness he deserves. I was just really had high hopes. But just two years later, on January 28, 2006, Janine Patton fires a shotgun right into her loving husband's head. After claiming Troy's death was an accident, she changes her plea to guilty of first-degree murder for less jail time. She's sentenced to 30 years. Janine's been locked up for the past eight years in a Lincoln, Illinois state prison. And I've gotten permission to conduct her first on-camera interview since the murder. It's an all-women's prison, and it feels very much more relaxed than the men's prisons we visited. They were just kind of walking around. Everyone moves freely, or more freely than I was accustomed to. So we go to wait for Janine in the interview room, and then she just walks in, completely unescorted. Hi, Janine. I'm Michelle. It's nice to meet you. There was nothing scary about Janine. She does not look like a killer. She does not look like a person with a bad temper. She clearly put some effort into her looks for the meeting. You know, she's got her green eyeshadow on, and her hair has been done. And, you know, she wanted to look good. She literally looks like a fourth-grade teacher. Before I met Janine, I thought she wanted to do the interview because she wanted to tell her side of the story to defend herself. She's not eligible for parole, so this interview can't help her get released early. And right off the bat, she's denying that she ever wanted to kill Troy. There's never been a time that I wanted him dead. Not a moment you wanted him dead during that fight? Never. I mean, I would get angry with him, but... I never thought I could live without him. So naturally, she's going to stick to her same old story, at least in the beginning, and I expect that. But it tells me that I am going to have to be a bit more strategic if I want to understand the whole truth of why she murdered her husband. Janine claims that she had a rough childhood, and that's something I see often in criminals— 
people who have experienced abuse as children do have a higher propensity for criminality as adults. But I have to take what she says cautiously because Janine has a history of lying. What was your family like? Was there abuse in your house growing up? Um, I remember being thrown across the room kind of at a young age. She tells me that as she got older, she recovered memories of sexual abuse as well. I started having these flashbacks. It was like a whole vision. And it was of me, younger, and I was being sexually abused. I was around two or three. With each flashback, it gets a little bit more elaborate. It's almost like a almost like a movie that plays Mm -hmm. over in your mind. It is possible for the brain to block traumatic memories and then recall them years later, especially in cases of sexual abuse in early childhood. But it's impossible for me to assess in this one interview whether her memories are real or just part of her ploy to portray herself as the victim. I decide not to press her on this, I have to choose my battles carefully here, and if I empathize with her now, she may be more likely to open up to me later. It was very hard. I think that would be a trigger for anybody, is mm-hmm. feeling like you're on the defense, that you need to protect yourself. Yeah. Janine marries young at age 22 and has a child, but it doesn't work out, and she claims she was mistreated yet again. We just kind of fell away. I held on as long as I could, and then I just, I got out of the marriage. And how about your second marriage? I walked right out of one into another, and I knew the day that I got married, I shouldn't be getting married. She literally goes from relationship to relationship, and we all know people like this. It's what I call monkey bar relationships. Literally, don't let go of the last guy, the last rung, until your hand is securely on the next guy or the next rung. These people are never single for very long because they're deathly afraid of being alone. So no surprise, Janine tells me her second marriage quickly goes south, too. And again, it's because the husband is abusive. She's starting to sound a little bit like a broken record, always painting herself as the victim. He was more verbal. It's like nothing was ever really good enough for him. He slapped me there, I think, like maybe twice. But here's where I think I catch her in a lie. According to police reports, her ex-husband claimed that he wasn't the violent one. She was. Special Agent Tim Hansen corroborates his story. He was concerned enough that he kept a journal of the daily occurrences because Janine would lose her temper and be short-tempered with the children and be rough physically with them. She would fight at the drop of a hat. And if need be, she'd drop the hat herself. I've heard that you could be very aggressive. I got that way. Yeah. Um, Would you say you have a a bad temper? um, Yes. If I feel you're caging me into a corner, I get scared and I lash out. Now we're getting somewhere. Janine is finally admitting she has issues controlling her anger and aggression. But listen to her word choice here. She's saying it's not her fault, it's someone else's. What got you upset? What would make me angry is he would try to put a, that it was always my fault. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, failure, the failure, the fault and the failure. You just get to a point to where um, no matter what you do, it's not enough. Because of her insecurities, she interprets the slightest criticism as an attack. She seems to me like she has traits of borderline personality disorder. I'm not comfortable slapping a diagnosis on her, but people with borderline personality disorder might have dysfunction in the region of their brain called the insula. And that part of the brain is responsible for how intensely we feel negative feelings. She only perceives things in emotional extremes. So when Janine's mad, she's furious. When she's sad, she's wildly depressed. It's like I go to a very dark a dark place. Yeah. One night in 2003, while her second husband and children are home, Janine is out with friends at a local bar, something she does a lot. There, she meets 32-year-old Troy Patton. 
While speaking with Troy, Janine claims that she's stuck in an abusive marriage and is trying to leave him. Once again, making herself the victim. Troy, being the nice guy that he is, buys the story hook, line, and sinker. He falls hard for Janine, and they begin a secret, passionate love affair. Here's what Troy's sister, Lori, remembers. My brother was kind of being her knight in shining armor, getting her out of that relationship that she claimed was so bad. I really could tell that he really loved her. What made you fall in love with Troy? He's so fun to be around, and he's so loving and so full of life. We both just, we hit it right off. We were like two pieces of puzzle that went together. Another hallmark of borderline personality disorder is something called splitting. And that is when you view the people in your life as either a hero or a villain. And they can become a hero or a villain overnight and switch back and forth. Janine probably idealized her second husband, but at this point, he's gone from hero to zero. So Janine left her husband and moved right in with Troy and his two daughters in late 2003. Just a few months later, they got married. I didn't think I would ever get married again. And I didn't really want to, but then I, I, you know, I loved him so much that I did. At the beginning, everything was rosy for Janine and Troy. But it's inevitable that the pendulum will swing the other way eventually. What would get you going? What, what would upset you about Troy? We both would get verbal with each other. And I would get caged in if he'd come real close to me. I get, I lash out. It was a trigger. There it is again, the sense of being caged in, even when she's the one who starts the fight. So at this point, Janine starts to get physical with Troy, even in front of the children. There's a fight. Could you tell me a little bit about that? I was driving, and we were both kind of going back and forth, and he said something to me. I can't remember what he said, and I'd hit him. And then I felt really bad after I hit him. I can see that Janine's getting uncomfortable now. She wore it all over her face. She was sweating. Her lips were pursed. She was trembling a little bit. You can almost see what happens to her biologically. You can see it as it's happening. According to Troy's sister, Lori, Troy played down Janine's physical abuse. I seen my brother, and he had a black eye. And I asked him, what happened? And he just kind of brushed it off, smiled, you know, laughed about it, made a joke about it, but said that it was Janine. While it's not as often that women are the perpetrators of domestic violence against men, it does happen. And when it does happen, the men are a lot less likely to admit it or to seek help for it. Despite the abuse, Troy wants to save the marriage. I don't think that my brother ever thought about leaving Janine. He loved her children and he'd already had one failed marriage. He was determined to make it work. I just started getting very scared that she's really going to hurt him. It's not long before Janine goes back to another old pattern. In December of 2005, she's working as a nurse in a healthcare center and starts an inappropriate relationship with a patient. Eventually, the patient reveals lurid details of their sexual affair to staffers. But Janine claims it's a gross exaggeration. Were you ever intimate with him at all? Um, we had kissed, yes. And that's really about it. There was only kissing? Yes. Janine adamantly denies the affair. But once she realizes the truth's caving in on her, she dumps her first story and accuses the patient of raping her. You said you were raped by this man. He tried, he tried to um, take advantage of me down in my office, yes, but he didn't actually, he didn't, what I want to say. He tried to, you know. He tried to get down my pants, and yes, he tried to, but I said, no. Why did you tell people you were raped? Well, basically, that's what he tried to do. I mean, he tried to, he got as far as where he al almost penetrated, but he didn't. So to me, I mean, it was close to it. 
My guess is that she knew she could lose her job and her marriage over the relationship, so in a panic, she said she was raped. In an attempt to gain Troy's sympathy, Janine tells him about this alleged rape. But when Troy insists that she report it to the police, she refuses. Why did you report that? I was scared because I knew I'd already crossed the line with him, and I didn't want to lose my job. I deeply loved Troy, and I had just messed up. He was hurt. Meanwhile, Janine's unraveling. She's tangled up in her own lies. She's panicking, and the fights are becoming more frequent. This woman is a ticking time bomb. On January 27, 2006, Troy and Janine meet up at a bar after work. He still can't understand why she didn't report the rape, and he starts accusing her of having an affair. Troy had a lot of anger inside for me, and I had a lot of anger at myself and mm. the whole deal. And yes, we were, we, it was a bad argument. It was a bad argument. Yeah, but as far as any violence. Didn't it get a little crazier at the bar? Wasn't there a beer bottle thrown? Yeah, I threw it against the wall. There's no way you didn't have a role in some of this. Oh, yeah. I did lose my temper. I remember grabbing a hold of him at one point in time, and I remember his shirt, I think, got tore. They leave the bar, but when they get home, they're still fighting in the driveway and screaming. Then she runs into the house and locks Troy out. I was just so full of anger and so full of pain. It's like I felt like I was like exploding in my head. You know, I just I couldn't take it anymore. I remember loading the gun. She threatens to commit suicide, loud enough for Troy to hear. I remember going into the bathroom, and I remember shutting the door, and I remember the barrel of the gun to my head. And I want to end it so bad. I wanted so badly to escape all this pain and hurt and like a rage that was inside of me. And I was just at my breaking point, my mental breaking point to where I couldn't like comprehend anymore. I couldn't process anymore. To me, this seems like an emergency tactic. She sees that this is spiraling into him, realizing she had an affair, blaming her, and so she pulls the suicide card, so at least he backs off for a minute and the focus can be on that while she regroups. That shifts the environment, shifts the schema. Now he's going to come to her rescue or to her aid or at least stop pestering her at the moment. Walk me through the next few steps. Um, I guess he kicked in the door. I didn't even hear that. He kicked the door down. I mean, in. It was broken. I don't know what to sit. And I didn't, I didn't hear it. You didn't hear it? I didn't hear it. You walk out of the bathroom with the gun. And then the next thing I know, I see something like fall. I didn't hear the gun. I asked myself, st- still to this day, how do I not hear a gun go up? When I realized that he was like slumped down against the bed, oh my God, I couldn't figure out what the hell had happened. And I just dropped the gun, and I remember going to him. And I look at me. And I just kind of grabbed his face and I remember screaming, just screaming. The gunshot took Troy's right ear off and exited out of the back of his skull. The wound is massive. His pulse and breath are fading fast. He dies two hours later at a local hospital. Police bring Janine in for questioning, during which she vomits twice. People can do this from grief, but I think it was a little bit more complicated for Janine. I think there was grief, but there was also terror. She was worried about herself. She knew that she was going to go to jail if she couldn't get her way out of this mess. Here's Special Agent Tim Hansen again. She gave the impression of someone who was suffering someone who was a victim. 
something just didn't seem right about the way she was expressing herself. Janine would cover her face and cry. I could see her looking at me between her fingers, like a child might do when they're crying and they're not really crying. Janine initially tells cops that she thought an intruder had broken in. She claims she didn't see it was Troy. She says it was dark because the light was off, and rather than run away from this intruder, she shoots at him. But later, she changes her story and says the lights might have been on. The lights. Were they on or were they off? I think he was flipping it on. It was like a flash of the light and the movement. I told you there's bits and pieces I don't remember. So the light came on, I think and then you shot him. him. Yeah. It was, it was kind of like about the same time. Because like I said, I seen the movement. Because and... he's facing you. He's yeah. facing you when you yeah. shot him. Well, kind of, yeah. So far, Janine has admitted that she has these wild mood swings and she can get aggressive when pushed or cornered, but she has yet to really take any accountability for killing Troy, even though she just made a crucial admission. The lights were on. Now I know she's lying, so I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna admit her story doesn't hold much water and maybe she'll be pushed into telling me the truth. People would believe you if you said, I was pissed. We were in a fight. He I wanted pissed. him dead for a moment, and I want to hear you say it. I can't say that I would try to kill him because that's not what I was trying to do. Was I pushed to the brink of breaking? Yes, I was totally there. You don't, your mind's just like in when you realize that you've, you, I couldn't believe that you know, the gun went off, so no matter, I had to pull the trigger. I had, you know, it was just, it was so much for me. That's as close to a confession as I'm going to get. It's frustrating, to say the least, that she won't take clear responsibility for her action in this one tragic moment. Janine is charged with first-degree murder and put in jail to await trial. But even prison can't stop this incredible urge to not be alone. According to detectives, she begins writing love notes to a fellow inmate. She just killed her third husband, and she already has a new love interest. It's always this pathological need to be in a relationship. And the letters were never made public, so Janine does not know I've seen them. I had the letters in my hand. I read them. I don't even, I don't, I really don't know what you read then. No, I know in the county there was a young gentleman. He was he was sending notes. We would write each other, but... And you said you loved him and you were his future wife. Future wife? I don't even... I don't remember writing anything about a future wife. You said you wanted to have a child with him. Well, that is kind of impossible because I can't have any more children. So I did love him as a friend, but I would have never wrote that. Janine is glaring at me. Her eyes are black with fury. She's completely livid because she knows that these letters show that she didn't have a whole lot of remorse over Troy's death. Janine faces a possible sentence of 45 years to life in prison. So after claiming Troy's death was an accident, she changes her plea to guilty of first-degree murder for less jail time. On January 8th, 2007, she gets 30 years behind bars. Why did you take that plea then? I was tired. I was tired of going through it all and seeing what it was doing to everybody. Do you regret taking the plea? Um, sometimes, yes, I do. Sometimes I think I should have fought a little harder. Between the love letters and her vagueness about the night of the crime, she knew if she went to trial, her story was going to be picked apart. But I think that she took that plea because she thought there was a possibility she could have gotten life. So she took the plea and the shorter sentence. Troy's sister, Lori, is convinced that Janine's decision is further proof that it wasn't an accident. If she really, truly didn't mean to kill my brother, she would have went to court, and she would have taken her chances. Taking 30 years in prison... 
just convinced me even more that she meant to do it. So there's the question. Did Janine deliberately murder Troy? After talking to her, I'm convinced this was not premeditated. Had she really wanted to kill him and get away with it, she would have planned it so much better. I never premeditated. I never planned on his death. But it was also no accident like she claims. The intruder story is bogus. She admitted the lights were on, so Janine had to have seen it was Troy. Ultimately, I think Janine felt trapped, and her rage was out of control, and she snapped. I don't think she necessarily wanted him dead, but in the moment, she couldn't stop herself from pulling the trigger. Do you believe that you deserved any time for this? Yes, I do. I took a life. And, um, I took a father away from his children, a son, a brother. All I can do is really say that I'm sorry. And, but I just wish that I had never happened and that I never meant for this to happen. Is this real guilt and remorse? Maybe, maybe not. I think it's obvious that she's upset, but I think that's because she's in prison. And the sadness she feels is a bit for Troy, but mainly for herself. It's self-pity. She's the victim. Still. It's tragic for the family Troy left behind. His two little girls who are growing up without their father. And his mother, who has lost her only son. I don't know if I can ever forgive her. She tore this family to pieces, taking him away from us. He was needed. He was loved. She had no right to take him from us. I think Janine wanted to do the interview because she has had some time to get some clarity and she wants to have an opportunity to explain herself. But she doesn't identify with being a monster. She really thinks that there's more to the story and it was an accident and it's not what people think it was. I think this pattern is pretty standard for Janine. I mean, I believe with her first husband, she grabbed his service revolver and threatened to kill herself at one point, which is a similar story to what we have here. I mean, it was a perfect storm. She was in one of her rages and there was a shotgun there. Had there not been a shotgun, she probably wouldn't have ever killed anybody. 